Kia ora team, welcome to our third biomechanics screencast. Today we're going to be looking at inertia, maximising ground forces, and then we'll briefly uh, introduce qualitative analysis, um, which is really important when it comes time to analyse our squash serve up at Club Calvin in a couple of weeks' time. Moment of inertia is defined as uh, a quantity expressing a body's tendency to resist angular acceleration and it's, it's dependent on two things. First of all, the length of an athlete's body parts and their ability to flex and extend certain body segments at the correct time when executing movement skills. The second is the length of striking equipment used in the physical activity itself, as striking implements are an extension of body segments, for example a squash racket that you're holding in your hand. Longer levers are slower and require more effort compared with shorter levers, but allow greater speed at the end of the lever arm. So this increases the force which can be imparted to projectiles when throwing and striking objects. Shorter levers can be moved with less effort and more speed, um, which is great when you need to react quickly or use very little effort. This image illustrates the idea of moment of inertia using a broom handle. When the mass is more concentrated around a spin axis, identified here, the stick is very easy to twirl and doesn't require much force at all. However, when the mass of the broomstick is distributed away from the spin axis, shown here, the stick is harder to twirl and requires a lot more force. Applying moment of inertia to a sporting situation is, is easy. Take the St. Louis Cardinal here. Now let's, um, just to make things easy, let's assume that the axis of rotation is located here. We know that when you swing a bit there's going to be other movements from the, from the shoulders that will change where the axis of rotation is, but just to make it easy for this example, we'll assume that it's that blue dot. Let's also assume that he, the bat that he is holding is a short bat. So the short bat when swung requires less effort, moves faster, but generates less force. The bat will approximately follow this path just here. Now let's increase the length of the bat here. So let's just draw, make this bat a little bit longer. Alright, it doesn't quite look like a bat, but that'll have to do. When he holds a longer bat, the swing takes longer to complete, it requires more effort, but it generates more force than the short bat. It will follow approximately this path here. So you can see the differences in travel the lever takes when you vary the size. So a short lever can be moved at speed with less effort, but produce lower speed at the end of the lever through less force. Long levers moved at the same speed as the shorter lever require more effort but produce more force at the end of the lever. Newton's third law states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This principle is used by players when accelerating and decelerating. As their legs push against the ground in a certain direction, the ground propels their body in an equal and opposite direction, allowing them to move. The direction and magnitude of that force can be enhanced by players learning how to lower their body towards the ground and developing the necessary flexibility and strength to push into the ground in a more horizontal direction. Also, by having quick footwork, um, you can generate a number of successive forces in a certain direction um, by having a larger amount of foot contacts. This diagram demonstrates both the acceleration and deceleration phase. In the acceleration phase, um, as the player is running forwards, ground reaction force is applied behind the player's line of gravity. If you look at Rafael Nadal here, um, he applies force into the ground down here, which gives ground reaction forces accelerating um, him to his left. Then if you look from frame A to B, Short steps allow the body to reposition itself quickly and apply different ground reaction forces when the player wishes to change direction. In the deceleration phase, as a player is running forwards, ground reaction forces applied in front of the player's line of gravity. 
So as you can see from frame E to F, on those two circles there, force is applied into the ground um, in front of the player's line of gravity, um, which causes a ground reaction force to decelerate the body. So essentially the critical um, features here of the acceleration phase are short, sharp steps to generate a large number of foot contacts. The body leans forward, you can see that with the same bolt in that inside lane there, with bent legs to apply horizontal force behind the line of gravity. So you can see that, that's quite evident there. Weight is supported on the balls of the feet to decrease the contact time on the ground. In the deceleration phase, the critical features include um, the front leg bending to absorb impact forces and slow the body down safely. The front foot extends forward to apply the largest force possible in front of the body and short sharp steps in front of the body to generate a large number of braking forces. So pretty much just the opposite of the acceleration phase. And we may just have a closer look um, at a same bolt uh, running this 100 meter world record um, on the next slide. At this point we're briefly going to introduce qualitative analysis. Um, this will carry on for the next uh, week or so, particularly when we start looking at how we're going to be analysing our performance in the squash unit. So qualitative analysis is the evaluation of movement technique and can be used to improve performance in sport, industry or, or everyday life. Movement is analysed using a number of methods and requires integration of many sport sciences for effective analysis and diagnosis of technique. Pause the video now. Take a look at these six um, factors here and see if you can describe what roles you think each of the factors play in qualitative analysis. We will go through what's called a skill improvement process. So skill improvement, improvement process involves analysing skills and comparing current performance to an elite performance. And once you've done this, or once this has been achieved, deficiencies in skill technique can be addressed through a regime of practice and then re-evaluating skill performance to check for improvement. So this really explains the process that you'll go through as part of the, the Wednesday practical uh, components up at Club Calvin. Step one is called skill performance profiling. And this is our first task to do. After selecting activity, ours is squash, you then gather information about the skill requirements of playing that sport and elite performance. You then break down activity into its core components, for example attacking, defensive footwork, teamwork, tactical. Then you'll divide the core components into the individual, individual skills necessary and identify the main purpose or objective of each one. Finally, in this, in this step of the process, you'll break down individual skills into phases and identify the key points needed to be, to be successful in each phase, creating a method of assessing each aspect. So that's it for today. Um, please take some really good notes because I want to have some good discussions about some of this stuff um, on Friday, period two. We probably won't touch too much on the qualitative analysis, but it's really important coming through in the coming weeks that we have a good grasp of what this is and how we're going to implement it with our squash unit. Okay, um, And we, we, we probably just touch on it a little bit on Friday.